sorry. Uh, everything's back on as usual this week. Uh, I do want to just continue to give out a call out for volunteers. Um, if you or anyone you know is able to help out with some of our youth work, the more volunteers that we have for that, the better. Um, it would be great if you could uh, speak to me about that afterwards. Um, we have a teen cafe on Tuesday night, uh, which has got a good wee crew going to it, and the Impact Youth Club on Thursday night as well. And if we can get a good roster of volunteers helping out with that, it makes it so much easier. Um, so uh, please do uh, think about that or think about someone maybe that you know that could help out with that, uh, who is a Christian and can help out with these groups. Uh, I'm going to begin our service by uh, singing, uh, not by singing. I've still not quite got over the jet lag. I'm not going to sing to you. I'm going to read to you words from a song from Psalm uh, 36. I'm going to read verse, um, verse 5 to 9, and then together we are going to sing uh, Christ Alone, Cornerstone. So let me read these words from Psalm 36 as our call to worship, and then we'll stand and sing. Psalm 36 says this, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast in the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. This is the God that we worship, the God who wants to give an abundance of goodness to sinful people and forgive them and restore them and invite them to his heavenly feast. So let's stand together and sing. We're going to sing Christ Alone, Cornerstone, and it's a song again that reminds us of this good God we have come to worship.
as we seek, we're going to um, begin our service by praying to this uh, great God who has saved us and given us everything. And we're going to pray um, for a different nation as we usually do because we want to see the good news of Jesus spread through, throughout the world to all the nations. And we're going to pray for a church that we are connected with as well. Uh, we're going to pray this week for the nation of Slovenia, um, 2.1 million people. About 50% of uh, Slovenia would say that they were Christian. I think it's kind of nominally Catholic, really. Uh, but the evangelical church would be around about 0.1% uh, evangelical Christians there. Uh, Slovenia has had a Protestant witness since the Reformation, but still has very few evangelical churches and needs church planting teams. Uh, the very small evangelical population is divided by ethnic group. And so we want to pray for unity. We want to pray for uh, an evangelical alliance to unite the churches. And we want to pray for a lot of these churches that don't actually have any full-time pastors. Um, there's a huge need in this country for missionaries. And so we'll pray that God would raise, it up, uh, raise up missionaries, put it on people's hearts to go there. Um, uh, vital Christian resources are in short supply with the death of local fellowships, availability of quality materials in Slovene is vital for both discipleship and evangelism. And we want to pray for an awakening in the mainline churches that draws nominal Christians into a real living, saving faith in Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray for the church in Slovenia. Uh, we're also going to pray for Kiltarlite Free Church, uh, which, um, oh, because mine is not here, near the Black Isle. Is it actually near the Black Isle? Near Inverness? Right, near Inverness. There you go. Um, Catalyte Free Church near Inverness. Uh, so uh, we're going to pray for them. This is their prayer points. As a congregation, we have raised funds to employ a full-time female uh, community and family worker. There are many opportunities to connect with families in our community. However, to date, we've been unable to find someone to take this role. So please pray that God would place it on the heart of a woman to apply for this role. Another prayer point they've asked for is this. One of our elders has recently moved, and as a congregation, we are seeking to elect new elders. We only have two at the moment. So pray that God would raise up future leaders for us as a church. So pray for both these things, the nation of Slovenia, and for Kiltarlite Free Church as well, and for ourselves as we come to study God's Word. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we gather as your church this morning, we want to begin by just reflecting on who it is that we have come to worship. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice is like the great deep. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. Father, we acknowledge your greatness, your majesty, your power, your authority, but we also rejoice in your moral perfection, in your goodness and your love. All that is good and perfect and holy comes from you. You're a God who overflows with love and kindness. And Father, we have seen that shown to us through Jesus Christ. For Father, we want to admit this morning that as your church we are sinners here gathered. We are sinful people who have let you down in so many different ways. Father, we admit that we haven't loved you. We've been stale. We've been cold. We've not even thought about you at times. Father, we admit that we haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. We've been selfish and introspective. It's not just what we have done. It's what we have not done, Lord. And Father, we do want to confess to you the many sins, even just in the quiet of our heart, Lord, we, as we reflect on them, as we reflect on coming to worship you as your church, we want to bring these sins to your throne of grace and say, have mercy on us, God. And Father, we know that though our sins may be great, your mercy is far greater. We know that your love is unfailing. And that you will forgive us of all iniquity, not because we deserve it, but because you are good. And so we praise you this morning for Jesus, for the one who has taken all that sin on himself and suffered for it in our place, 
so that we could be restored, so that we could be brought back to you under the shadow of your wings, so that we could feast in abundance in your house. Father, you are the fountain of life. You are the God who has shown grace and mercy to sinful people like us. You have restored us and made us your children. And so this morning, we gather and worship you and give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. We know our salvation is rooted in Christ alone. Thank you, Lord, that we are clothed in his righteousness. Father, that wonderful gospel to be set free from sin and brought back to you, that is the gospel we want to see spread throughout this scheme and throughout this nation and throughout the world. And so, Lord, we pray for your church this morning, and we pray particularly for your church in the nation of Slovenia. Lord, we pray and ask, Father, as we see that bountiful harvest, we pray and ask that you, the Lord of the harvest, would raise up laborers, to go out, to plant churches, to disciple your people and to build up your church in that nation. Father, would you put it on people's hearts to go to Slovenia with the gospel? Father, we pray that the mainline churches there would be awakened to the necessity of proclaiming the gospel. We pray against nominal Christianity. And we ask, Lord, that people would realize they need to have a a living, saving, real faith in Jesus. Father, please would you supply your church. Please would you give them the resources they need in their language so that they can both do discipleship and evangelism. And Father, would the name of Jesus be honored. In Slovenia, we pray. Lord, closer to home, we want to pray for Kiltarlity Free Church up near Inverness. Father, we thank you for their desire to reach people with the gospel and for the funds that have been raised for this community and family worker. And Lord, even now we ask that you would be putting it on someone's heart to go there and to do this job and to reach the many people, the many families in that community with the good news of Jesus. Father, would you raise up another elder for the church there? Would the leadership be humble, united together, round your gospel, serving the people of that church so that they can proclaim Christ wherever they are? Father, please would you bless that church and their mission in this part of our country. And Lord, we want to pray for ourselves as we come to study your word now. We pray and ask that, Father, if there's any of us that need challenge this morning, would your Holy Spirit challenge us? If there's any of us that need comforted this morning, would your Holy Spirit comfort us? (coughs) Father, you know our hearts, you know what's going on. Please speak to us powerfully through your word. And would we leave here rejoicing in Christ our Savior? We pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, uh, if you do have a Bible, please can you open it up to Matthew chapter 22. Um, Should be on page 990 of most of the Bibles, um, unless you've got one with a a little mountain picture on the front, in which case it's on page uh, 746. But for every other Bible, it's on page 990, 990, Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read verse 1 to 14, parable of the wedding banquet. Um, Let me give a bit of context. It's been a month since we were last in Matthew's gospel. Um, Matthew is a written account of the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the way Matthew writes his gospel is he splits it into uh, five major sections. So we've been doing a series uh, looking at chapters 19 through 25. And it's a part of the gospel where Jesus arrives in the city of Jerusalem the week before his death. That's what's going on. And Jesus, as he is there, faces a lot of conflict, particularly from Israel's religious leaders. Now, in this whole section, the big thing that Matthew wants to highlight is the authority of Jesus. That is what has been questioned. That is what has been uh, challenged. And we've seen as we've studied this, that when Jesus enters Jerusalem, his authority is not embraced by everyone. In fact, immediately he is in a confrontation, with, particularly with Israel's religious leaders, a group that was known as the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, in many ways, that's really, really shocking. 
So here's what you've got to understand, and particularly as we come to chapter 22 here. The nation of Israel was special. This was God's chosen people. When God made a plan to save the world, it began with this nation. He gave them his promises of salvation. He told Israel that one day a king, a Messiah would come who would bring in a salvation for them and for all the world. And so when Jesus comes as the fulfillment of that promise, you would expect the guys who had been waiting for it, the nation who had been waiting for it, you would expect them to welcome him with open arms. But they didn't. In fact, a week on from where we are in chapter 22, they will crucify the king who has come to rescue them. And it's really shocking, and it gets us to ask, well, why is that the case? And as we've studied this, we've realized that the main reason that was the case was ultimately because they were proud. Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees, they wanted to be the ones who were in charge. They wanted to be the ones who were in control. And here in Matthew, what we see is that when Jesus comes, yes, he's come to bring salvation, but he's also come to make it clear that he has come to bring judgment, judgment on any who reject him. And he's telling these religious leaders that that judgment is going to begin with Israel and his rejection of him. Now, at the end of chapter 21, he tells the, par- he tells the Pharisees three parables, three parables about why they have rejected him. We saw two of them uh, about a month ago during Iona's baptism and uh, Stephanie's baptism. And now we're going to look at the final parable that he tells them. So Matthew 22 Uh, The parable of the wedding banquet, and I'm going to read verse 1 to 14. Now remember, Jesus is speaking to Israel's religious leaders. That's the context. They've rejected him, and this is what he says to them. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, ill-treated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there, who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Amen. This is God's word, and we are going to study that word, very somber word this morning. Uh, We will study that parable together. Uh, But before we do, we're going to sing. We're going to sing from Psalm 130, uh, from the depths of woe, Martin Luther's version of this psalm. And this is really helpful just as we come in to study this passage, because it reminds us that people who are genuine Christians are those who are constantly seeking God's help, repenting and asking him for forgiveness. And Psalm 130 is essentially a psalm that cries out to God for mercy and waits for his mercy. So let's uh, stand together and we'll sing from the depths of woe.
to have a seat and get your Bibles uh, open back to Matthew chapter 22 and that uh, little story, parable of the wedding banquet. Uh, you know, there's real power in stories, isn't there? That's, I mean, it's kind of Jesus' main teaching method actually was rather than just saying something he would often tell a story he would tell a parable that would make his point make his point really effective sometimes a story can get under your skin and sometimes it can help you become aware of a danger that otherwise you might have been unaware of so before I went on uh, before we went on holiday a few weeks ago I was seeing that there was a, a news article on uh, the BBC about a show, a TV show that came out in the 1980s called Threads. Do you know that? You know what it's about? So this was a show that came out uh, in the 80s, and it was, from what I gather, a TV show that was set in Sheffield that was about what would happen in the UK after a nuclear war. And it was well known at the time, this is why there was an article about it, it was well known for being probably one of the most shocking and depressing TV shows that the BBC had ever aired. In fact, it caused a lot of trauma, and people were really shaken by it. But the showrunners, when they were talking about the show, they said that that's exactly what they wanted to do. Why? Because they wanted people at the time to be aware of just how dangerous this kind of growing arsenal of nuclear weapons was. In fact, it was at that time that Ronald Reagan, the then President of the United States, he also watched a film. This film was called The Day After. And again, it was about kind of the after effects of uh, nuclear winter. And Reagan says that when he watched that film, he knew what he needed to do. And immediately he met with, uh, I think it was Gorbachev at the time. I don't know. Uh, it's before my time. He met and they agreed to significantly reduce their nuclear stockpile because they knew that what they had was the potential to end the world. Now, of course, they all knew, everyone knew, yeah, nuclear weapons, that's dangerous, that's dangerous. But it was these narratives, these films, these stories that got under the skin of some of the most powerful people in the world and got them to realize just how dangerous a thing it was. Jesus' parable here in Matthew 22 is a story like that. It's quite shocking, really, if you, if you kind of see what's happening here. It's a story that begins with a, a gracious wedding invitation. And do you see how this story ends in verse 13? With a man being cast out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now think about that. That's... A horrible image, isn't it? And Jesus really, I think he really is intending to, to shock us. Because like the writers of Threads or The Day After, he wants to warn people of a danger that they are maybe completely unaware of. But this danger is actually far worse than nuclear winter. Jesus is wanting to warn us about the very real danger of God's judgment. And he's telling this parable to people who think that they're fine. People who think, oh no, we're safe. People who think we're on God's side. And so this is meant to get under their skin. And I, I would say as well, actually for the church today, this is meant to get under our skin a bit. The worst reaction to a story like this would be, oh, that's fine, it doesn't bother me, that's not relevant to me. Oh no. But I do want us to see something about Jesus. We've seen it all in this section of Matthew. The defining trait of Christ is compassion. And so when Jesus warns you, it's not to crush you. It's to help you. To help you run and find safety if you are in danger. Do not approach this thinking... This is not relevant for me. Jesus is speaking to everyone. Now, I want to be very clear on something. I'm going to say it just throughout this talk. If you follow Christ, no matter what you have done in your life, you are completely free from judgment and safe. That's what's great about this gospel. 
you can have an assurance that if you've really trusted Jesus, all your sin is paid for. Jesus came to save you from judgment. That's the whole reason he's going to go to the cross. Nothing will change that. But I guess a parable like this gets us to ask, have you really come to Jesus? And it's helpful to examine ourselves in that way. Not so that we look to ourselves, but so that we remind ourselves, even as we just sang in that psalm, how much we need Christ. There's nothing we can bring. We desperately need him. And so here's the plan. What I want to do with this, I just kind of want to walk through the story, try and understand what is this story illustrating, and then we're going to draw three applications for uh, the church, for us today. So uh, let's have a look at the story. Now, the parable of the wedding banquet, I would argue it's split into two parts. In verse 1 to 7, we've got an invitation. King sends out an invitation for his son's wedding, and we see that that invitation is rejected. And then there's consequences to that. And then in verse 8 to 13, we get the second part of the story, which is about the invitation being extended to other people so that they're brought in. But then we've got this weird kind of curveball at the end of one guy who's in the wedding, but he's not dressed appropriately, and he ends up getting kicked out to the outer darkness. And so in each section, you've got this kind of structure. You've got an invitation then you've got rejection, and then you've got a consequence. And I would argue that what Jesus is really doing here is addressing two different groups of people. So in verse 1 to 7, that is addressed to the Israel of his day, particularly to these religious leaders he's speaking to, the Pharisees and and the scribes and so on. It's addressed to them who have rejected him. But in verse 8 to 13, it's as if Jesus stops and addresses his church. And that section is addressed to the church today. So let's have a look through it. The first seven verses are a warning to Israel. Look at verse 1. Jesus spoke to the religious leaders again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So he's telling this story. Why? So that we'll understand what the kingdom of heaven is like so that we'll understand who's in the kingdom of heaven. So what do we have in the story? We've got the king. Who's that? It's God the Father. And he prepares a wedding banquet for his son, who is Jesus. Yeah. And the wedding banquet is itself a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the moment when all suffering and pain will end, and there's perfect joy as people are are brought back to God forever in this joyful celebration. Now, the religious leaders of Israel would have been familiar with this image because it's an image that you see quite often in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, The prophet Isaiah said that one day when God's king would come, he would come to save the world. And Isaiah 25, he says that he will wipe away every tear. He will destroy all sin. He will get rid of death forever. And the image he uses to describe that day is to say it's going to be like a great feast great wedding banquet, right? So the Bible doesn't describe heaven as people in skirts, sitting on clouds, playing harps. No, the dominant image for the kingdom of heaven, and I love this, is a party. It's a feast. Uh, Yesterday, I was uh, with Lockheed United. Um, We had a game against Peterhead, and I went up uh, with the team beforehand and unbeknownst to us and the committee, I don't even think I was meant to be there, but somehow we ended up in the hospitality suite of Peterhead. Um, and honestly, it's the best football hospitality experience I've ever had. It was like five-star dining. And we were just, I, I've never eaten so much food at a football match. I was having everything from like mince and tatties to um, oh, cheesecake, um, oh, the selection of cakes. It was like just thinking about it now is making me, me, me hungry. So, and it was just like we were loving it. I mean, I, I don't know if I should have been there, but I was sitting with the other committee, and they were like, this is great. This is great. We were just like, this food's amazing, and we were just helping ourselves. And it was a time kind of a real joy and celebration. And so I love the fact that heaven is compared to a feast with the best food that you could ever imagine, with joy and celebration. 
Heaven is a time of happiness where, where it doesn't end, where love does not fade, where these tears are wiped away, where suffering's undone, where we're with Christ, we're brought back to God, and all that's messed up with this world is gone forever. And Jesus is saying in this parable that the God of the Bible is inviting people to that. He wants to save you. He wants to bring you into that banquet. That is what he offers to sinful people like us who wrong and offend him every day. And this great offer of sinners being saved and brought back to God, this was the offer that Israel had. For hundreds of years, they were his people. And so Jesus speaks and he says to these religious leaders, God was inviting you. He was inviting you to be saved, to be rescued, to have this wonderful banquet. And you kept rejecting him. That's who the people rejecting the invitation are in this parable. It's them. It's Israel. It's the religious leaders of Israel. God was constantly holding out this invitation to them. And so they spurned it. You can read their history in the Old Testament. They rejected him. What does God do? When they reject the invitation, does God say, right, that's it. How dare you? I'm never sending you that again. No. Verse 3, they reject the invitation. But what does God do? Verse 4. Yeah, later on he does. But even for them, he sends his servants and he keeps inviting them. And he's almost like he's trying to entice them. The servants are going, look how good this is. Please come back. Look at this wonderful meal that, that I've prepared for you. God wants to give the best to those that have mistreated him. Come to the wedding banquet, he's saying. Even now when Jesus is warning these Pharisees, it's as if he's saying to them, come on guys. Don't you realize what it is you are rejecting? And so Jesus is painting a picture here of God sending his prophets and then sending his apostles, sending his servants to Israel with this glorious message of salvation. And what do they do to these servants? They don't accept the invitation, no verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. Some heard the invitation, they're like, nah, not for me. I've, I can't be bothered with that heaven stuff. I've got, I've got my business I need to focus on, thank you very much. Others heard the invitation and actually it made them angry. And they killed the messengers who went out and gave the invitation to them. And if you think that sounds ridiculous and over the top, you need to read the Bible, because that's exactly what they did to the prophets. That's exactly what they did to Christ when they crucified him. And that's what they did to many of his apostles too. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, this is you guys. It wasn't all Israel. Thankfully there were many, like the apostles who came to Jesus. But the religious establishment, this is you. You had the offer of salvation and you rejected it. You think you're godly, but you're rebels. And God is patient, and he continues to invite, but eventually there is a time where that patience runs out, and God says, enough's enough. And so in verse 7, what does the king do? He raises up an army to go and destroy the city of those who'd killed his servants. Now, you might think that's over the top. It's really not. Like, uh, it'd be like today, if someone attacked the British embassy in a foreign country and killed all the diplomats and everyone there, what, what's Great Britain going to do? They're going to pronounce, they're going to go to war against the people that did that, of course. And that's what this king does to those who spit in the face of his gracious offer and murder his servants. And Jesus is warning Israel. And look, verse 7, you know, it's an image, isn't it, of these parables are imagery. But it's also something that literally happened. In chapter 24, Jesus is going to speak to them of a time when the temple and their whole institution is going to be destroyed. And in the year 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. The Romans came into Jerusalem, burned the city, destroyed the temple. Judgment came. They rejected the Messiah. And judgment came. Now, 
You can read that. Here's the thing, right? Whenever you read the Bible and you see the Pharisees, they're kind of like pantomime villains. Like if they came onto the stage, we'd all be like, boo, you know, because they're like hypocrites. And um, it's easy to, to kind of think of them like that. But this is where we, we've got to be really careful. Um, they, they actually were very well respected in their day. And there is a danger that we might not be Pharisees, but we could be like Pharisees. And so Jesus doesn't finish the story there. He has another bit to the story. And I would say the next part really is a warning to the church today. Look at how he goes on, verse 8. Then the king said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited, that's reference in Israel, the people of his day, they did not deserve to come, so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, this, what's this talking about? This is talking about when the good news of Jesus goes beyond the borders of Israel and all the Gentiles now are invited in. People that you would not expect. They are brought into this wonderful wedding feast that God has prepared for them. And so the king sends his servants, that's his apostles, his church to go out. And who are they to invite? Everyone. Everyone is invited to come in to this feast. The good, the bad, the ugly, doesn't matter. Everyone is invited to come in. Being a Christian is not about being good. Being a Christian is about accepting the invitation of the God who is good. If you have come to Jesus and if you repent and follow him, you are forgiven. Every wrong is wiped away and you're part of the feast. And wouldn't it be great if the parable stopped there? Don't reject Jesus, accept him and you're in the feast. Wouldn't it be great if it just faded to black and then the credits rolled up? All these people coming into this wonderful wedding that God has prepared. But that's not how Jesus ends it. There's a real sting in the tail. You see, there is a man who appears to have accepted God's invitation, but something's not right. Look at verse 11. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. See, the wedding's happening now. The guests are all there, but someone is not dressed appropriately. So um, uh, even today we get that wouldn't be acceptable. So David and Kendra aren't here this morning, but uh, I did their wedding not too long ago. How do you think they would have felt if I had turned up to do the wedding in my Iron Maiden t-shirt, pair of boxers, and house coat, dressing gown? If I was there, but I was dressed like the dude from The Big Lebowski, they wouldn't think, hey, that's okay, as long as you're here. If they had seen me, I mean, they would freak out. I don't know what David would do. Um, they, they would be like, what are you doing? You can't, you're meant to be, you can't come to a wedding dress like that. You can't do the wedding dress like that. And if I did that, what, is that, what does that say about me? What does that say about how I view them? What does that say about how I think about their special day? Well, it says to them, well, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to dress how I want. It would show a complete lack of care and concern for them. And they would probably say to me, Andy, you need to go. You can't be here dressed like that. What's Jesus saying at the end of this parable? You know, there's people who outrightly reject the gospel, like the Pharisees. But there's people who might not outrightly reject it like that, and yet they still reject it. People who might say, I'm a Christian, I've accepted Christ. But they've not really. It's like they're not wearing the right clothes to the wedding. What are these right clothes? You know, I've read a lot of commentators this week on this. Everyone's got many different views about what it could be. I think we just really need to look at the context of everything that Jesus has said to these Pharisees. In Matthew 21 and 22, what is Jesus looking for from Israel? What does he want to see? He mentions it 
time and time again. He's looking for what he calls the fruits of repentance. He judges the temple. Why? Because they, it's not bearing the fruit of repentance. He says to the Pharisees and the tax collectors, look, the, the, the Pharisees, sorry, he says to the Pharisees, look, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are getting into the kingdom of heaven before you. Why? Because they listened to John the Baptist's message about bearing the fruits of repentance. He said in the last parable, look, this vineyard is going to be taken away from you and given, the kingdom will be given to those who bear the fruits of repentance. What's Jesus looking for? He's looking for those who have humbly trusted in him, not themselves, who've repented of their sin. Have you really repented and given your life to Jesus? And if you have, well, there should be an evidence of that. Not an instant change, but it's like fruit that is growing on a tree. It just gradually changes you. It's slow. Actually, one of the things that happens when you do follow Jesus is you start to become more aware of how messed up you really are. The direction of your life now is... is is pointed towards him. The person at the wedding who doesn't dress right is someone who says they follow God, but there's no change in direction, there's no repentance, there's no desire for Christ, and no dependence upon him for their salvation. Truth is, they don't care. They're dressed the same as those who have refused the invitation, do you see? And what is the consequence? Well, you can see it in verse 13. It's far worse than the destruction of a city. Darkness, gnashing of teeth, weeping. That's what Jesus talks about, eternal judgment. And here's the big point he wants to hit home in verse 14. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Oh, the invitation goes out to all but not everyone gets in. Some reject outright. Some say they accept, but they don't really. And yet to reject this is the worst possible thing that could happen to any human being. See, it's not a happy ending, is it? But look, as I said, Jesus warns to save us, not to crush us. And the word of God cuts to heal us, not to wound us. So let me draw out three applications from this story. Because actually there is some wonderful, wonderful news. And there is safety, there is refuge, there is assurance to be found. But it's in Christ, not ourselves. Here's the first. First obvious application of this is accept the invitation. Yeah? If you haven't, I don't know, but if you haven't, accept it. Now, today. You don't need to be a good person. You don't need to go home just now and try and sort your life out and get things sorted. No, God loves you and he is inviting you now to come to the wedding. He will save you. He will forgive you. He will change you and you will be part of his glorious restoration forever. But you you need to accept it. It's been held out to you freely. Look, the judgment of God is very real and it is far more terrifying than nuclear winter and Christ knows it. And how, how unloving would it be for Jesus to just gloss over this and not talk about it if he knew that's where you were going? How loving of it is it not for Christ to, to use imagery to say, look, don't. Don't go there. Now look, whenever we talk about God's judgment, here's the mistake we're all going to make. I think even as Christians sometimes. When we talk about the judgment of God, we might start misunderstanding this because we misrepresent God and we misrepresent ourselves. So sometimes people can think like God is this harsh tyrant waiting to smite down people and we're just innocent bystanders. Oh no, the opposite is true. What do we see in the parable? He's the gracious king holding out this invitation to all people. And the people who reject it are rebels. We are sinners. Every wrong that we do is a great offense to God. And yet you must see this, that the God of the Bible wants to give the best to sinners who have offended him. He is offering this broken world salvation. And for him to give that to us, for him to give us the best, to bring us into this feast, it would cost 
him dearly. You see, the person that God the Father loves most is his son. And if you and I are to be invited to be with him, his son has to be given up to that cruel torture of the cross for our sin so that we can get into the banquet. That invitation held out to us came at such a cost, and yet he paid it because he wants you. I was reading a guy called Bishop J.C. Ryle. He's got a great commentary on Matthew. J.C. Ryle's the man. If you ever read him, it's well worth it. And this is what he says. Listen to this. There is nothing wanting on God's part for the salvation of a sinner's soul. No, No one will ever be able to say at last that it was God's fault they were not saved. The Father is ready to love and receive. The Son is ready to pardon and cleanse guilt away. The Spirit is ready to sanctify and renew. The angels are ready to rejoice over the returning sinner. Grace is ready to assist them. The Bible ready to instruct them. Heaven is ready to be their everlasting home. One thing only is needed, and that is that the sinner must be ready and willing themselves. It's there. Accept it. But so many people don't. Why? Many are invited, few are chosen. Why? Verse 5. You see why they reject it? I just don't care. I'm not that bad. And they have other things in this world that are more important. I've got my field. I've got my business. I need to focus on my job, my family, my house, my problems. I, can't be, I don't need this God stuff right now. And they're so preoccupied with this fading world and their own little ventures that they spurn the God who made this world. And the eternal banquet is rejected for dust. Well, some don't care, but in verse 5 we see the other group. Some are angry, hostile. Why? Because they want to be in charge. No one tells me what to do. I live life my own way. I'm the boss of my own life. I can do this myself. And you know what God's judgment is? You can see it in this parable. God's judgment is when he says to sinful people, okay, you can have what you want. If you don't want me, then fine. You will not get me. And that's awful because he is light and joy and love. And outside of him, there is only darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't reject what is offered. Accept it. Accept this if you haven't already. Secondly, dress for the invitation. (laughs) Look, you don't need to do anything for God to save you. You just need to come to Christ. He's done everything for you. He's done all the work. Just come to Christ. But whilst we come to Christ as we are, it's very important to realize that Christ does not leave us as we are. If we are genuinely united to Jesus, our lives should change. Jesus doesn't want people to think that just because one time they said his name, or because they were brought up in a Christian household, or because they got christened and baptized, or because they went to church, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in his kingdom. This parable says to us, okay, you, you say you're a Christian, but are you dressed like a Christian? Not literally, you know, no, there's no, it's not sandals and jumpers or whatever. No, are you dressed in Christ? Are you united to him? Are you living for him? Are you repenting every day? Is, is your life different to those who haven't accepted this invitation. Now look, Jesus is not trying to shake our assurance that we can have in him. So what's wonderful about the gospel, we're never wondering, if we're in Christ, we don't need to ever wonder, am I in or am I out? Because if we're in Christ, we're always in. Some of you might be genuinely following Jesus, but right now you're struggling with a particular sin. That doesn't mean you're not real. That's what happens. It's what we do with that sin that helps us see, have we accepted it? Are we seeking Jesus' mercy? Are we seeking to turn from it or are we just not bothered by it? That sin that is eating away at you has been paid for by the blood of Jesus and he loves you. Don't despair when you fail. Give it to him and as he says earlier in Matthew's gospel, come and find the rest for your soul. You see, the right clothes of the wedding guest is not a perfect life, it's a repentant life. 
It's the fruits of repentance. Remember, that's what Jesus wanted to see, that humble dependence upon him, wearing the right clothes, is not trying to better yourself, but realizing, I need Jesus. Father, forgive me. Help me walk in obedience to you. If that's your prayer, then my brother and sister, that's a sign that you're real, genuine, safe in Christ's love. But Jesus is against deception. He doesn't want there to be anything that's fake or false because he loves people and he wants them to come and find real faith in him. And if you know, if you're thinking right now, gosh, I don't know if it is real, what do I do? Well, you come to him. The invitation's there. Get dressed. Repent. Come to Jesus and he will never, ever turn anyone away. Final application here. Extend the invitation. The gospel, the free offer of salvation, is an invitation to everyone. See that verse 9? Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. Feel that when you're out, even on the church in the street, literally here, inviting people to church, inviting them to Bible study, inviting them to the banquet. God sends out his messengers with this invitation. And the next time we see that go command in Matthew's gospel is right at the very end after Jesus has risen and he says to his disciples, go therefore to the nations and tell them the good news of my salvation. And so we're called to go and to share this gospel, to share this invitation. Who are we to share it to? Everyone. The good, the bad, the ugly. No one is beyond God's saving grace. Look, if we get this, if we have really accepted this wonderful, gracious offer of salvation, we wouldn't want, wouldn't we want others to, to hear about it? This is about eternity. Nothing matters more than this. And so use this parable to encourage you to realize that everyone you meet is in need of this. Sometimes we think, you know, there's only certain people I can talk to about Jesus. No. Gospels to be offered to everyone. I'm not saying you ram it down their throats if they're saying back off, but having that awareness that everyone needs this is so important. We pray for people. And as a church, we want to extend this invitation to everyone, to the poor, the rich, the sick, the healthy, those who think they have life sorted, those who know that they don't, to the addicts, the drinkers, the thieves, the liars, the grafters, the good moral people, the families, the single mums and dads, the lonely, the outcast, the Muslim, the atheist, the agnostic. It doesn't matter. We want to plead with everyone, come to Christ today. Come to your Savior and find the rest that your soul needs. Come to the banquet and to the God who saved you and loves you and gave his son to die for you so that you could be his. That's our invitation. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this very sobering uh, warning from the Lord Jesus. Lord, it's sometimes difficult when your word speaks such truth to us, but we know that it always speaks to heal, not to wound. And so, Jesus, we pray that this parable would help us see the gracious invitation of the gospel how patient and kind you are to hold this out constantly, even when it's rejected. Father, help us see how important it is to have that living, real, genuine faith in Christ, to be dressed appropriately, and help us extend this invitation to everyone that we meet. The banquet is open for all people. Lord, would we share it with all people, knowing that your grace can transform even the hardest heart and so, Father, we pray and ask that you would help us to live a life of repentance and obedience and so honor Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that our salvation is not dependent upon us. Lord, we've mucked up so many times. We need your mercy every day. But we thank you that our salvation is safe and secure in the Savior who died for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to sing in a moment, but does anyone have any questions about that passage? I think, I think God knew that Israel was going to reject him, but he still held that hand out and offered him in.
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think when I say Israel, I don't mean you don't mean all of Israel, because the good news of Jesus goes to the Jew first, then the Gentile, and obviously the church is made up of Israelites, of Jewish people, the apostles, um, Paul. Um, it began with the Jews, and then it spread out to the Gentiles. But the the majority, the kind of religious state of Israel and the leadership, they were the ones that rejected him. Yeah, yeah, and I think there seems to be more warnings about that in Matthew's gospel than about not being a Christian. So, yeah, I think so. That's the the thing, and if it unnerves you, that's probably a good thing. It's if you feel, oh my goodness, is this me? That I think that's probably quite a healthy reaction. If you think that's not me, I'm fine. I can't be bothered with that, or you don't you don't really care about it. That, that's maybe a bit more worrying. So he said, Jesus said this a number of times. Way back in Matthew 7, he says, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, like, will be saved. He said there'll be people in the day of judgment who say, did I not do all these things in your name? And Jesus will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And I remember chatting to a guy this week about it, and he was like, man, that verse kept me up for like three nights in a row because I was so anxious about it. Um, and I think there's a healthy level of anxiety to have with that because it keeps us safe. But we mustn't be overly anxious because really if you have genuinely trusted in Christ, that's not you. Um, the person who says, did not I do this, I do this, is focused on themselves. The person who's genuinely trusted in Christ is, like the hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And just like holding on to Jesus. And if you're doing that, and these kind of warnings just actually although they shake us, they're actually meant to assure us. Because if I'm taking that seriously, that shows that I am real and I am listening to him. But Jesus knows that there will be people who use his name, who ab- abuse his name and think they're safe, but they're not. And so it's very kind of him to warn such people not to do that. But he's still going to allow them to come in. Yeah, well, Even if they've shunned them, you know, then the time comes to us. Yeah. He's not going to let them put his hand out. Well, yeah, Matthew 12, he says, every sin can be forgiven. He even says, even if you speak wrong, spoke wrong against me, um, but if you refuse him continually and think you're safe, you will not, which is why this man ends up in the darkness here. I, I think you made a point there because the people that did deny him, didn't want him, it's evidently clear. They didn't want him anyway. The thing is, the, the biggest thing for me is the repentance thing. As Christians and as followers of Jesus, when you feel we sometimes get embarrassed, we get we're in denial, we're scared, we're afraid of sin, but we didn't see the importance. It's clear there in that scripture. Repent. Yeah. Run back to God and admit your fault. Yeah. And we will be forgiven yeah. because Jesus wants us to run back to Him because we fail every day. Every day we make mistakes. But the thing is, sometimes as Christians, I and mean believers in Christ, we tend to just feel we're blunted, we feel guilty, we feel bad, we feel stupid. Or we're questioning if we're a Christian or not. And well, but the thing is, you made it clear today, and it is clear today, Jesus is making it clear, come to him. Yeah, come that's the solution. If you ever feel that, if you feel like, oh, well, that's not me, you just come to Christ. Yeah. It's not, there's nothing, it's not about building up stuff in you. No come to Jesus, you'll be saved. No, what you gain here, it's Jesus is telling you, come back to me. Yeah. But be truthful to him. Yeah. Yeah. And Andy, do you think um, if we accepted the Lord, if we came to not walking in repentance, yeah. can you do that? You would imagine the Holy Spirit would convict you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think he would. I think you get people who've accepted Jesus and they have dry periods where they feel far from God and they've not communicated much to him. That doesn't mean that they're not Christians. Um, it means that they've just, you can slip away. Um, but I think, how do you come out of that? Through repentance um, all the time. And something like the book of Psalms is really helpful. 
Like just, you see them repenting all the time. God, I'm going to wait for you to save me. I'm crying out from the depths of woe. Um, but yeah, if there's not repentance, all, all of life is to be repentance. Because um, it shows, repentance says, God, I can't do this. I need you. And that's a very healthy stance for someone who's a real follower of Jesus. If you think you're fine, you're sorted, and you start looking down on other people, thinking you're better than them, you don't really speak to God and ask for repentance, like the Pharisees, that's, that's dangerous. You're probably not on God's side. And you need to repent. Come to Jesus. Yeah. And among the things you said about the wedding I'm going to just say I disagree with you. Is that you mentioned about the that's how what the fruit that we do. My only concern is if we are secure in Christ, how how humble should we be? How many works should we be still in ourselves to be secure in that and not and not be like How? Because that my concern is if we are secure in Christ, yeah. and though we, we are, you know, if, if we're having to self examine ourselves for signs that we are saved, yeah. that, maybe that's what I'm misunderstanding with you. But yeah. that's, that's for me is how we're coming across, and I'm, not, I'm a little bit wary of that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, so what I would say is so I think that's what the text is saying. Um, I think the uh, clothes is signs of. Uh, someone who's genuinely repentant. So the scripture says that quite often, 1 Corinthians 10. If you think you're standing firm, be careful lest you fall, Apostle Paul says to the church. Um, it, there's a lot of warning against presumption. And there's a lot of call in the Gospels to examine whether or not someone has genuinely accepted Christ. Um, so from, right from Matthew 7, where Jesus says, by their fruits you will know them. Um, and that's what he's talking about there. And so it's very clear here in chapter 21, that's the one thing when he's coming to the temple, curse the fig tree, wasn't bearing fruit. That's what he says. It's what he says in the other two parables, what's missing from the Pharisees? Why is it the tax collectors and prostitutes are getting in? Because they repented, bear the fruits of repentance. Um, what does he say in the next parable, the parable of the tenants? The kingdom's going to be taken from the Pharisees and given to who? To those who bear the fruits of repentance. Um, and so, yes, you're saved only by Christ alone. But obviously, that faith and works thing, as, as the reformers said, faith is never alone. Um, it will be accompanied with these fruits. And if these fruits are not there, then the question is, have you really accepted Christ through faith alone? And I think that's what this parable is designed to do. I do not think, as some of the commentators said, that the clothes that Jesus is talking about here is his imputed righteousness, because um, that's not what um, the context of the passage says. That seems to be the context of what Jesus is saying. And it's always kind of funny when I read stuff like that. People always want to read their theology into it, a text rather than letting the text shape their theology. So I would say that that, that seems to be from the context what he's saying. So it doesn't take away from the fact that, yes, you can be completely safe and secure, but there needs to be that evidence of the Spirit's work in your life that shows that you have that saving faith uh, in you. But then the, the, the question, it still begs the question, how can we be sure of that? Because if we, well, my concern is, is that we might not see it. We might not, we might not see it. We, might, we, may, we may look at the facts and look like we still continue to feel that, yeah, No, I don't think that's what I'm saying. I think you need to be repenting. You need to be looking to Jesus if you are concerned that's you. So how do I know that's me? Well, I'm constantly bringing it to Jesus and trusting on him. That's how you know it's you. If you're not, if you're just introspective and thinking only of yourself, that's more of a worrying sign. Um, but you, you bring it to Christ constantly and trust in his free, saving grace. And that's what repentance is. You know when you're repenting, you're like, 
we're saying sorry, trusting in Jesus. Um, and that, I think that is quite clear. It's like Martin Luther says in his 95 Thesis, God has willed that all of life should be repentance. Um, and, I, and I think that's what Christ is saying here. The danger is when you stop doing that and you become presumptuous and say, I'm in the church. And I think that's what Jesus is warning about. But the fruits of repentance never have that, well, there's not a presumption in ourselves. But there is that assurance in Christ. Um, but yeah, that's the balance in a passage like this. You can be absolutely sure and safe and secure in the gospel. But yet what you see all throughout the scripture is Jesus wanting Christians to, to make sure that they do have that fruits of repentance. And it is interesting that the most times, actually almost all the time that Jesus warns about hell, he does so to Christians, not to non-Christians. And it gets us to think, well, why is that? Um, because he's wanting that real living, saving faith in him, not in ourselves. So the worst thing to do with this parable would be to go home and say, I need to try better. Um, the thing you do with this is, I need Jesus. God, help me. And help me just find the assurance and security that you give me. Um, and I think that's what the parable is designed to do. But it is meant to unnerve, unnerve us. Um, but that can be healthy. It can also be unhealthy, but it can also be, can be healthy too. Um, Go on, one last one, because we need to sing. Yeah. Um, I just think, like, faith and works together in the Bible, go, you're saved by faith, but it's always accomplished by works. So, yeah, part of that is repentance, obedience, um, following God, and that, that should be... Sorry? Yeah, like if you have genuine faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit has transformed your life, then you'll want to walk in step with that Spirit. doesn't mean you'll be perfect. No, but it's more but like you change to put trust in Christ. Yeah, trusting in Christ, absolutely. And the Spirit's transforming work in your life. Walk in step with the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says. The Bible, New Testament's full of what we call uh, commands. Like, like, this is what you're to do. You've got Ten Commandments, but then you've got all the New Testament as well about stuff like not letting the sun go down in your anger, speaking the truth to one another in love. But all these commands are motivated by the gospel. And the gospel, because you are forgiven, therefore this is how you should live. Yeah, just that, that's the kind of sign that God's at work in your life. Absolutely. And basically, if someone says they're a Christian and there's no change and they're just kind of going around doing what they want, then it's probably not real. Like there should be a, a evidences. Well, saying that they're doing all this and they're repenting and they're actually not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 I was just thinking, just when you were describing that, we're going to like, if I really love someone, if I need to um, learn something that people have for this time, go to the game and say, I'm going to say, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like that, yeah, why? It, I don't want to hurt God. I don't want to sin because I love him. And that's the main, the main motivator for change, isn't it? The person who just wears what they want to the wedding doesn't care about the person whose wedding it is. But... Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Right. Let's sing. Uh, we're going to sing a final song. We will feast in the house of Zion. It's a reminder of this great feast that God has uh, through Jesus. So let's stand and sing.
And may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever.